Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, this is Mr. Miller back here. Who else would it be? Uh, this is Wednesday, the 25th of March. Uh, it's Wednesday already. I lose track of my days. It's crazy. Uh, living in this bunker, it is uh, difficult to keep track of keep track of time. So uh, I just go based on what the computer tells me in terms of the dates, what time the computer tells me it is. I just go with that. So I think it's Wednesday, the 25th. That's kind of what I'm operating with. So uh, our plan for the day today is going to be to wrap up these chapter 37 notes uh, to finish this up. Uh, that's going to be the goal. Uh, I have just three more points to uh, talk on here, uh, talk about the Cold War tensions, uh, Eisenhower era, and then uh, there's part of uh, some information about the election of 1860 in there, as well as some art and literature. So. Uh, that's all I got for you. Once we're done with that, we'll be done. So uh, we'll start out here with uh, Cold War tensions rise again. So hopefully you still have your notes from the past couple days and you can get those out um, if you haven't already. If you haven't, you should pause the video and get that out right now. Okay, I'm ready to go. Uh, so the Cold War tensions rise again. Uh, we have a big moment here in 1957, uh, and it is a moment that is kind of uh, thrust upon us in some ways. Uh, it is not anything that we did as America. Uh, it is something that uh, Russia or the Soviet Union did. Uh, basically, they end up launching uh, a satellite up into space. Uh, it is called Sputnik. Uh, Sputnik, I believe I have that on your notes sheet. Uh, so Sputnik 1, uh, it's a satellite. It is pictured right here. There's the picture of Sputnik 1. Uh, it is uh, just a little shiny ball of metal with a transmitter in there uh, and some antennas off the end of it. Uh, and this thing was flying around in space and orbiting the Earth. Uh, and so this was launched in October of 1957. Uh, and this was the first, uh, the first satellite that was launched by either, uh, I guess, by anybody on the Earth, at least as far as we know. Uh, definitely by either uh, the Soviets or us. Uh, so they had kind of beaten us into space in some ways, uh, at least in terms of getting a satellite there. So that part is questionable for our purposes uh, in terms of America. We're worried about this. Uh, we weren't even close to sending a satellite in space, and the Russians just did it. Then what they end up doing a month later, uh, they end up sending uh, a different satellite. Uh, the satellite is called Sputnik 2, uh, very original naming here. Uh, Sputnik 2. Uh, Sputnik 2 is, <clears throat> that's a little bit of nervous laughter here. Uh, for any dog lovers out there, of which all of you guys probably are, uh, this is going to be a sad moment. Uh, Sputnik 2 was sent up into space and it was carrying the first living animal. It was carrying a dog. Uh, the dog's name uh, was Laika, L-A-I-K-A, L-A-I-K-A, Laika. Uh, rest in peace, Laika. Uh, I guess I'll talk about how she died. Uh, so it is uh, basically what they did was they wanted to see if uh, they wanted to see if uh, a living animal could uh, survive the uh, transition into space and orbiting the Earth. Uh, so they put uh, a pressurized capsule and and put uh, poor Laika in there, uh, and she could move around. She could stand up and she could she could uh, kind of move back and forth. I guess if she needed to, and there was there was. Uh, food that was dispensed. Uh, it was, I guess, gelatinized food, so it would be okay out in space, uh, and some water. Uh, and it was a pressurized cabin. Um, what ends up happening? Oh, I should say, uh, they basically just found this dog. Uh, it was a stray. Laika was a stray. So they just went out on the streets of Moscow and found this dog. I can imagine it. Uh, oh, you're the one who gets to go to space. It's very, very, very strange. Uh, but they found this stray dog, so... Uh, Leica goes up into space. Now, Leica, uh, there was a microphone that was attached inside of the uh, inside of the capsule, uh, and so they could hear uh, some information. I believe there was a microphone. They definitely had uh, sensors that were rigged up uh, to Leica, so they could tell if she was alive, uh, what her blood pressure was like, all that stuff, um, her heart rate and whatnot. So uh, it starts orbiting the Earth, and she made it through three orbits of the Earth. Uh, things had gotten really, uh, this is like, 
again, all this is all this is very very sad. I would say that it is it is <laughs> nervous laughter, uh, nervous laughter that I'm laughing at all this. Uh, but it is it is a sad thing. Uh, so what ends up happening is is they report that the uh, the dog after three orbits is doing fine. Uh, the internal temperature of the cabin was up to like 110 degrees, which if you know anything about like like hot days in your car, like that's not something that you leave your dog into. You're supposed to like take your dog with you, not even just crack the window, right? Take your dog with you. Uh, don't leave your dog in a, in a hot car trapped, uh, dogs or children uh, for that rate. Uh, basically, she died somewhere in the middle of the fourth uh, in the middle of the fourth orbit, they figure. Uh, and this was all, like, this thing was flying. Uh, so it made, uh, like, an orbit in, uh, I mean, the, all three of those orbits were done within a day. Uh, so it was uh, it was not a long time that she was up there surviving. Uh, they, uh, it was just kind of, I, I believe, I was reading up on it a little bit yesterday. I believe it was just a matter of hours, actually. Uh, the Russians, or I guess the Soviets, they uh, lied about how long she was up there. They said, oh, she's been up there for a week and she still survived. And so it was like this big thing. But uh, later on, they said, oh, no, she died a couple hours in. So that is poor Laika. Uh, rest in peace, Laika. Uh, that is all we can say for her. Uh, so that's that's a sad part there. Now, um, I'm going to get the, the poor dog off the screen here. So... Uh, now, America gets uh, wind of this and sees that this saddle, or these satellites are being launched up into the sky, and we had no idea what that was uh, entailing and how, how to do that. So, I mean, we had ideas, but we weren't ever successful. So um, Eisenhower ends up creating in, uh, in response to this uh, a program that we call NASA, uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, so NASA is created directly responding to the Soviet threat uh, with, with uh, Sputnik. So uh, also, America kind of has to rethink their education system. Uh, we realized that we were very far behind in terms of what students needed to know to be able to contribute to uh, this, this space race, I guess you might say. Uh, so we needed to kind of overhaul our uh, education system. Uh, we had this perception that the Soviets were miles ahead of us and that they had much better training and much better education. So what we decided to do uh, in 1958, the next year after the Sputnik was launched, both Sputniks, uh, we end up uh, passing the National Defense and Education Act, the NDEA, National Defense and Education Act. It gives almost a billion dollars uh, in loans to college students uh, and giving uh, grants to help out uh, help out teachers as they're trying to trying to learn new things, uh, specifically science teachers. Um, that was a, a big push. Uh, there were stories about people who were sitting in uh, sitting in high school and they were learning out of one textbook, and then all of a sudden one morning, uh, people from the government come in and they they take all their textbooks and they give them all brand new ones. Uh, and the, all these new ones had things like aeronautics and uh, aerospace engineering and uh, things like that, uh, physics, heavy stuff. So, so like they were totally overhauling the uh, overhauling the education system. Now, uh, these tensions are continuing to rise. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, pull up our next uh, image here. <coughs> it's not the coronavirus, I promise. <coughs> So um, in 1959, uh, Soviet leader uh, Khrushchev uh, ends up uh, calling for, in terms of uh, the United Nations, he goes to the United Nations and he calls for a complete disarmament, wanting to completely remove all, uh, all of this buildup that we've kind of been going through with the uh, Cold War. Now, uh, this ultimately... Uh, was kind of a pipe dream. Uh, it makes you think about peace, and it makes you think, oh, peace could actually happen. Uh, but there was an incident in uh, 1960 uh, called the U2 incident. Uh, U2, like the band with Bono and uh, whatnot. Um, so U2, uh, U2 was a, a type of plane, though, that America had. It was a spy plane. Uh, so American, uh, there was an American spy plane that was shot down in 
uh, over over Russia, actually. Uh, so this spy plane, the, the picture of it is here, the wreckage of the spy plane. Uh, so this plane shot down, that kind of ends any hope that people had had for kind of resolving this thing peacefully. Uh, we had this idea that, okay, maybe we could resolve things peacefully, but after this U-2 incident, it is uh, not really going to happen at this point. Uh, we had continued, even though we were talking about peace, we had continued surveilling uh, in, in using surveillance on uh, the Soviets. So it just didn't, didn't pan out at this point. Now, another example of some tensions rising up here. Let me go here. Hey, there's uh, our, our friend uh, to the south of America uh, in Cuba. His name is Fidel Castro. He's the one here raising his hand, uh, Fidel Castro. So Fidel Castro uh, comes to power uh, and leads a uh, an overthrow leads a revolution. Uh, there was an American, uh, there was support, uh, Americans were supporting the, uh, the government in Cuba, uh, and so Castro overthrows that government in 1959, uh, becomes aligned with the Soviet Union, uh, economically and militarily, uh, and politically too. So this is a communist, uh, communist uprising. So they are now because we had we had originally had them on our side with with uh, kind of having a democratic way of way of government. Uh, this overthrow then turns uh, Cuba to uh, communism. So uh, it now becomes a kind of a military satellite. Uh, we will get into a big period of tension when we talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which happened in 1962 with John F. Kennedy. Uh, but the Cuban Missile Crisis is. Uh, kind of uh, just three years after uh, Castro has taken over power here. And uh, it is a tense, tense moment, probably the closest that America ever got to uh, going into war with the Soviet Union, all based on uh, the Soviets putting uh, missiles in Cuba. So uh, we will get into that uh, as we go forward into the next chapter, uh, which we will get into probably in the next week. Um, so we're going to move on to the Eisenhower era here. Oh, uh, I'm getting news from my producer. I got I to gotta cut to commercial here. I'll be right back. frustrated with these uh, commercials that I'm running here. Uh, these, these advertisers are just ruthless. They are cutting into my show and not allowing me to, not allowing me to speak. It's almost uh, like they just don't want me to be able to talk here. Uh, it's super annoying. So um, <clears throat> I guess we're going to continue on. Hopefully we don't get interrupted again. Uh, so what was I saying? Oh, uh, we were at the end of the Eisenhower era, which is what we had just moved on to. So the end of the Eisenhower era, uh, we have uh, America becoming very prosperous during the Eisenhower time period, uh, during his time as president. Uh, when Eisenhower's president, it's a big period of economic growth, uh, like I was kind of just saying. Uh, the 1950s, it's just a, a decent time for America. Uh, we were talking about uh, the baby boom uh, last chapter. Uh, the baby boom, it is, uh, you know, a sign of the time. Uh, the baby boom is a time when people feel okay with America and they feel like things are going okay. Uh, and you, you have kids out of that prosperity, I guess. Um, so that's ultimately kind of a, a sign that the 1950s were, were pretty good for America uh, in most cases. Uh, we end up adding two states, uh, our final two states, into uh, the country uh, at the end of the 1950s. Uh, in 1959, Alaska and Hawaii uh, both become uh, states. Uh, we also have uh, kind of the, I guess, a challenge that Eisenhower was facing throughout his time as president uh, is is kind of kind of a question mark of okay during uh, during the. Uh, FDR and Truman administrations. We have a growth in the size and scope of the national government, federal government. Uh, the government is involved in more things than it had been involved in beforehand uh, in the 1920s and before. Uh, so, so 
Eisenhower's job is to try to figure out kind of how best, uh, how does this work in peacetime? How does all this stuff fit? Uh, how does it all fit together? Uh, so integrating these reforms into uh, normal life, uh, into American life, is kind of the kind of the focus for Eisenhower here. Now, uh, with Eisenhower's presidency, uh, he runs uh, uh, he runs in 1952, 1956, and then he's done. Uh, so 1960 is a uh, kind of a noteworthy election uh, that we should at least mention. Uh, so 1960 faces off. Uh, these two gentlemen here, uh, so I got them pulled up here. Uh, we have a couple famous guys. Uh, both of these guys are famous in their own right. Uh, both of these guys are future presidents. Uh, one of them wins now, one of them wins eight years later. Uh, so on the left, you have John F. Kennedy. On the right, you have Richard Nixon. Okay, uh, so John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Uh, if you know anything about the 1960s, you know that John F. Kennedy wins. Uh, so we'll talk about kind of why that happens. Uh, Republicans end up nominating Richard Nixon over here. Uh, Richard Nixon was the vice president under Eisenhower. Uh, and Eisenhower was a Republican at this point. So uh, Nixon, a Republican, uh, so he ends up running as the president or for president, I guess. Uh, John F. Kennedy uh, is from Massachusetts. He's a Democrat. Uh, and he is uh, kind of a progressive, I guess you might be able to say, uh, but he's uh, he's just very different from Richard, from Richard Nixon, and I'll talk about that difference uh, coming up here. Uh, this is uh, one of the first moments where we have uh, a religion kind of uh, religion playing a uh, major role in a uh, in an election. Uh, John F. Kennedy happens to be uh, a, a very very strange religion called. Catholic, okay, he's, he's a Catholic. Um, everybody else to that point was basically Protestant, and, and John F. Kennedy, he's, uh, he's a Catholic. Uh, a lot of people didn't like that. A lot of people thought that Catholic people just weren't real Christians, and we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be allowing them to uh, be our president. So uh, down in the Bible Belt, uh, which would be also part of like the Sun Belt, like we had talked about last, uh, last week, uh, part of the Bible Belt, which is like, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, that area, uh, the Bible Belt, uh, the, the religious South, uh, they are very, very opposed to voting for John F. Kennedy uh, because John F. Kennedy, he's not one of them. He's not a Protestant. He's a Catholic. So uh, that's an issue. Uh, Kennedy also, uh, he kind of centers his, uh, centers his campaign on uh, trying to stop, uh, trying to stop the way that things have been going, uh, he kind of pits uh, pits the status quo, which I guess Richard Nixon kind of represents, uh, because he's the vice president. Uh, kind of kind of puts that up against uh, the uh, new ideas that some of the Democrats had at the time. So, for example, uh, Kennedy looks at. Uh, the issues with the Soviet Union. He says, well, Soviet Union has gained on us and probably passed us in terms of their uh, capabilities. Uh, and that was all under the watch of Dwight D. Eisenhower and his vice president, Richard Nixon. So uh, we need to go ahead and change, uh, change our focus, change the way that we do things, change around uh, everything that we're kind of focused on. So uh, we need to uh, we need to essentially kind of uh, reinvent the wheel, or not reinvent the wheel, to totally reinvent ourselves and, and try to find a new way to go about uh, beating the Soviet Union. Now, uh, Nixon, on the other hand, is like, hey, things are going great. We've got prosperity in America, uh, and I helped do that, according to him, because he says, you know, I'm the vice president. So, uh, I, uh, Nixon, I helped do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm the guy who's going to lead us, continue us on into that prosperity. So it's kind of a, a toss-up between two different visions of America. Uh, we see that oftentimes in, uh, in uh, presidential elections. You can look at it most recently to, uh, to 19, or I guess to 2016, uh, if you think about it. Two very different visions of America uh, were presented. Uh, Donald Trump won that, uh, that uh, our government is kind of corrupt and uh, there is a great need for overhaul and our country has lost a lot of prestige. Uh, and that's the whole make America great again idea uh, compared to 
uh, Hillary Clinton's ideas, you know, America's pretty good and America's still a leader in the world and all that stuff. So you've got these com contrasting visions of America that happen here. Now, uh, one of the reasons why this election is so noteworthy is because of the use of uh, television. Uh, the 1950s were seen as the growth in uh, television uh, in America, uh, but the 1960 election was kind of the first uh, the first TV election, I would say. Uh, television is playing more of a role. I mentioned that Eisenhower used television to advertise and campaign. Uh, at this point, uh, at this point, Kennedy is using television uh, to a much, much better, uh, much better, more effective way. Uh, essentially, this is uh, a way for people to actually see uh, who is running for president. Uh, beforehand, you would just see people in photos in newspapers. And those newspaper photos were almost always very, very scripted and staged. Uh, and you wouldn't have uh, a situation like uh, a debate where everybody could kind of watch and uh, see what people were, uh, see how people were looking, see how people uh, looked at each other. And if they were calm, if they were uh, collected, if they had all the right answers, if they looked the part. Uh, that now became a uh, kind of an emphasis here. Uh, is no longer do you have all the right answers. It is do you look like a president? Do you look like somebody who I can trust with my vote uh, to run this country? So uh, there was uh, the first televised debate uh, in 1960, which nowadays there's so many of them. Uh, there have been like 20 debates uh, for the Democrats uh, just in the last six months. Uh, so there's lots of debates uh, nowadays. But at this point, this was, uh, to my knowledge, the first one. Um, you have John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Uh, Nixon and Kennedy were both kind of questioning, okay, well, how do we present ourselves on this? Uh, Kennedy decides, you know, uh, he just gets off the campaign trail. He's just been out in California. He's looking all tan. He's young. He's, uh, he's good looking in general. Uh, he is uh, just a uh, a guy that people, you know, gravitate towards. He's got charisma, but he decides he's going to uh, wear makeup and stage makeup and that sort of thing because uh, lights tend to make your face uh, more pale. Uh, Nixon says, oh, no, I don't need any of that stuff. So he refuses to wear that stuff. Uh, as a result, Kennedy looks cool as a cucumber on this, uh, on this debate, and Nixon kind of looks, uh, there's points in this debate where he's like sweating, uh, visibly sweating. Uh, he had to answer a lot of questions about Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was not really able to talk about his vision for America uh, because almost all the time he was being asked about Eisenhower and what Eisenhower would have done and why Eisenhower did what Eisenhower did. So he gets a little gets a little flustered with all this, and Kennedy looks looks way better, uh, looks the part of the president. So uh, Kennedy ends up winning, uh, gains support from workers as well as. Uh, African Americans and uh, the Catholic vote, uh, so he ends up winning this election uh, pretty easily. Like I said, Nixon comes back and he ends up winning in 1968, uh, but at this point uh, it is Kennedy's country. So uh, that will get us into 1960. Very quickly though, we need to talk about a couple things in art and literature. Okay, uh, let me just be honest here, okay? If you're looking for like Renaissance art, like beautiful, beautiful art, uh, this is not it. Uh, just kind of in my own personal estimation. Um, this is a guy named Jackson Pollock. Uh, Jackson Pollock is one of the most well-known American artists uh, ever, uh, maybe the most well-known, uh, but he has a technique that is called abstract expressionism. Okay, abstract expressionism. Uh, I was playing Trivia Crack the other day, and a uh, Jackson Pollock question came up. It said, this artist used ketchup and mustard splatters on a canvas to create art. I said, hmm, that sounds like Jackson Pollock. And I was correct, because uh, it was Jackson Pollock. Uh, Jackson Pollock was, you know, he'd dip his hand in paint, and then he'd just <laughs> do that. <laughs> uh, and then he'd pick the canvas up, and he'd be like, hmm, I like it. Uh, and then hang it in a museum somewhere. I don't know. Uh, it's amazing to think, though, that uh, this, this uh, whatever this is, uh, can sell for millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, it's just crazy, just absolutely crazy. Um, but 
that's America for you. Uh, so Jackson Pollock, abstract expressionism in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, also, we've got some literature things uh, that come out here. Um, there are a couple main authors in the 50s, uh, one of them being uh, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, Ernest Hemingway ends up writing uh, his most famous, not one of, mm, one of his most famous novels. I'd probably say his most famous novel. It's the only one I've ever read all the way through. Uh, it's called The Old Man in the Sea, uh, about Santiago, the, the fisherman from Cuba. Uh, so uh, The Old Man in the Sea, it's a good, good book. Uh, I would read it. Uh, but he's writing that at this time. Uh, there's also a guy named Joseph Heller. Uh, he writes a book called Catch-22. Uh, that comes out in 1961, so right about the turn of the decade. Uh, and that talks about uh, American airmen in uh, the Mediterranean Sea during World War II. Um, so that's kind of the, the I think it's World War II. I've never read that one. Uh, a lot of these books that we talk about in history, we've never actually read. We just know about them. Uh, like Uncle Tom's Cabin. Never read it. I know about it. Uh, things like that. So uh, I think that's all I've got. Uh, I think that is that is where we're going to leave off. So tomorrow I'll be back with uh, an activity to do. Uh, so I'll post a video on that. Uh, so that is the deal with uh, with our stuff today. So uh, again, I apologize for that uh, brief interruption in the middle there. Uh, I'm going to go make a phone call with my sponsor and make sure that they know that they can't do that again. Um, so uh, other than that, I will see you guys tomorrow. Uh, take care. Stay safe. We're getting to 10 tomorrow. 10. Yes. Okay. See you then. Um, see you then. Bye.